Hi, Neville. Hey, Dean. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. Uh, okay, so you just started a hypothetical one-year fractional CMO engagement, okay? Today's day one. Tell me what a fractional CMO is and does in the first 90 days and let people know who you are. Well, firstly, uh, Dean, thanks very much for the opportunity to, sure. uh, to do this. Uh, really, uh, really tough. And uh, hi to John. Uh, I'm Neville Pockroy. I'm a fractional CMO, for those who don't know, and that's a chief marketing officer. Uh, I usually get called when a company wants to kickstart its second phase of growth, which means I don't do a lot of startups because uh, the second criteria that I have is that those organizations have funds that are ready and uh, available to invest in holistic marketing. And for those that don't know what holistic marketing is, that's the broadest perspective of marketing available. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for many years, as my gray hair shows. And what I normally do is I show up with about 250 different marketing tactics, uh, which uh, most of which I've used in at some time in my career. And the first part of my job is to figure out which 15 or 20 of those tactics will get the client's sales to accelerate. And so these days I mainly work with companies between five and a hundred dollars in revenue per year. And secondly, they have a vision for where they want to be in the future. So that's who I am as a uh, FCMO. Uh, we actually, oh, I, I really have a very definitive process mm. um, that I work with clients um, from the start on. And I use a proprietary marketing audit tool that I've developed as a result of uh, the 30 years I've done, uh, been doing this. And it has four basic legs to it. Number one, deep understanding with no assumptions is, is, is step number one. And really that's to interrogate in a, in, in a very nice way, not only the uh, leader, but also the key players in his executive team, the C-suite, about what their real pain is. Very often they will tell me what's bothering them. But when I start asking additional questions, I'm able to raise or get a whole lot of different answers from them, which is not the same as what they volunteer. So that's number one. The second thing is to really clearly clarify their business goals. And business goals need to be written and communicated. If it's in someone's head, it doesn't exist in reality. So that's the second thing I want to do. And then get consensus on their desired markets and customer base that they're looking uh, to clarify. And that's not always a line as well. Uh, very often I get told everyone's our customer and we know that without right. that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, and do, have they written all of the stuff out and put it into a strategy or plan roadmap that helps them deliver. Okay. So that's step number one. Step number two is collaboration and not dictation. And so I actively work with the leaders of the C-suite after I've gathered, gathered this information in terms of developing the next steps. And, and that's really important because very often as a newcomer, existing people will be territorial and often put roadblocks in front of us. And so by working proactively with them in a collaborative way, uh, we, we, we prevent those roadblocks from, uh, from coming to the surface. All right. And particularly relevant with a sales leader. So developing synergy with that sales leader and a team approach is absolutely crucial. Third okay. step, thinking before doing. And I really use the first two steps to identify if the organization is a doing first organization or a thinking and planning organization first. And those are two very different kinds of organizations. For me, the doing first is a red flag. The thinking and the planning first, and then the execution second is a green flag, green flag for me. Uh, finally, speed with purpose. Once all that analysis and planning is done, we look at the business through marketing hours. And that's really what makes me different because it allows me to identify opportunities and protect to problems that they may have had that they've never identified before because I look at it through marketing eyes. Each C-suite executive 
would look at it through their eyes. But if there is no marketer on that C-suite, they're not looking at it through marketing eyes. And the perfect example is a number of years ago coming up with a solution that was not specific to a marketing need for them that they thought was in existence. Um, but it was the incorporation of a customer portal that gave them a customer service capability that made them very, very different. Right. And then once we identified those opportunity gaps, which is what we call them, we then move into uh, action planning and uh, put together very specific goals, responsibilities, timelines, and budgets based on short-term first, medium-term, and then long-term. So that's what the process is all about. That's what I think makes me different from lots of other people because it's very defined and very clear. Right. All right. Hey, hey John. Nice. Hi. Cool. Welcome. How are you, Dean? Good, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, same, same question, I guess. Let people know who you are and talk about uh, what a fractional CMO is and does in the first 90 days. Sure, sure. So my name is John Arms, and I'm a fractional chief marketing officer as well. And what a fractional chief marketing officer is and does, since I teach fractional all across the globe, uh, is we occupy a permanent seat in the org chart in a fraction of the time thought necessary. So uh, that's that's the that is the fractional way, and it's awesome, right? If you're a twenty million dollar manufacturing company, you don't have three hundred thousand dollars to hire a full time CMO, and nor do you need it. So uh, I do that for a living. I step in in a fractional way, and I occupy that vacant leadership seat. So that kind of leads to the next part of your question: is what value does a does a fractional CMO deliver to their client in the first ninety days? Yeah. So um, there, there's a couple of ways I want to sort of approach that. One is I'm gonna, actually I want to quote um, uh, is a great business trainer, teacher, coach, uh, author of Duct Tape Marketing. Have you guys heard of uh, John Janch? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just wonderful. Marketing leadership owns the message. Sales leadership owns the relationship. So we own the message, which means we own the top of the funnel. And this is where Dean, your wonderful skill set comes in. We own the beginnings. We own the beginnings. The very, you know, the Clark, uh, customer is going to go from total stranger to a wonderful relationship, right? And we own that top part. So our job is to own that and be responsible and accountable for the very beginnings and taking them through to a place where sales can happen. So that is the value in the first 90 days. And the only thing I would say about that, Dean, is you don't need 90 days to get there. I will tell you that in, in, in my studies and what I do, about 70% of businesses don't have a plan and right. inside of that, a marketing plan. And... Uh, and it shows really, really quickly, and it's very, very painful. And so uh, uh, when you have a good plan, you can have better results sooner. And oftentimes in the first 90 days, like I'll, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write a marketing plan. How are we going to do that? Where's the business plan? Where are the goals? All of that. Bring those together. That's like that's less than a 30-day window, at least for me and how I do it, and then you're rolling. So in 90 days, you should be having your strategy and planning tied in with your business plan and roll in roll in with the new beginnings that's what they can expect in the first 90 days and every every you know month thereafter uh so john stick with me for a second then uh, yeah. i want to i want to flip the perspective a bit right so mm -hmm. i'm the ceo of your client yeah. company okay? mm -hmm. uh, i probably had to you know persuade some people to put aside budget to get a one-year mm -hmm. fractional cmo Right. How how am I going to extract maximum value from that one year of having a fractional CMO? Or if you prefer, how do I not waste that money? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a that's a really really good question. So uh, the the way to get maximum value, since you've had to beg, borrow, and steal from someplace else in the business, mm -hmm. to even get money for a, for marketing as a thing or marketing as a leader. Where does that deliver value, right? Well, the very first value that is delivered in there is for the sales team. Because more than likely you have people doing sales, maybe one, maybe 20, right? And guess what they're doing? They're struggling because they don't have marketing air support. Right. They don't have a max. So you're immediately value. The first place value is delivered is 
hey, sales team, guess what? We have an engine in place now that is doing work for us to have a number of new relationships and warm leads for you to work out, to, for you to work with and contact and reach out. And that is the first place you are going to see value. The second place, at least with me and most fractionals I know, is, you know, there's two words in fractional, you know, leadership. And the second word is leadership. The second place clients tend to see value is, you know, we're, if you're fractional, you've got gray hair, man or woman, right? You've been around. And so uh, you know a couple things, right? You know that marketing doesn't work in a vacuum. It doesn't, it can't. And so you immediately start seeing, oh my gosh, marketing is going to go really well. We're repairing that. I'm seeing some issues with customer service. I'm seeing some issues with, uh, with product. I'm seeing some issues maybe with operations. We're going to see that. We're going to smell it, right? And we're going to bring that value as well. A lot of CEOs resist this at first, but then they realize, well, if I can't have the beginnings go well, because the middle's not really ready for it, this whole thing's going to fall apart. So the second part of value, so there's a vertical, you have that vertical lane of marketing covered. You've got a leader. I feel great. Good money well spent. And then horizontally, any good leader is going to look at that and go, here's other areas in your business that are probably going to need some shoring up uh, in order for the whole thing. Because, you know, marketing is, even though I own the lane, it's not in a vacuum, right? It is there in service of the company's growth. Right. So that is uh, that is the way to do it right. The way to do it wrong is what, quite honestly, happens most often. People advocate for marketing budget. They'll they'll buy a bunch of media. They'll do a bunch. They'll say, you know what? I'm going to go buy a list and, and and lean heavy into a list. You know, the strategy is not part of the discussion. It's just the budget and tactics. And that's usually a five, 10 X expenditure uh, against what a fractional costs. And right. that's all waste. So there's, there's three different areas of value extracted uh, in the first day in the first year. All right. And Neville, what do you think? I'm the CEO. How am I going to waste the money that I've, I've put aside for you? Or how do I get the most out of the money that I put aside for you? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with John, but I, I like quoting uh, Seth Godin. Uh, Seth Godin said, uh, the words matter. If you are hiring someone to be in charge of promotion or advertising or social media, whatever, say so. Mm -hmm. If you want someone to be in charge of marketing, have them be in charge of it all. If it touches the market, it's marketing. A lot of CEOs do not understand really what marketing is, and they look to areas of promotion for quick fix. And that's one of the key reasons when I go in and I evaluate what the organization is and how they operate. Are they doing first, or are they planning thinking organizations first? And very often, I will walk away from a doing organization that wants to hire me because that's the surest uh clue that you're being set up for failure oh my god so and, much so hire the right person and ensure that there's a right fit between the organization's culture and the, the way they do and think about business and the the fractional cmo okay and then give the mandate to that CMO, a proper defined mandate. And so for a CEO to do that, they have to be one thing, they have to be open-minded because a good CMO is going to challenge leadership with their current reality thinking, which has got them to where they are now. And the fact that they're looking for a CMO recognizes the fact they're not happy with where they are right now. Right. So if they're going to carry on doing the same thinking, that's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. So they, oh. the, not only the executive at the top, the CEO needs to be open minded, but the rest, of the, um, the rest of the executive team. Because with a good CMO, change may be necessary in the way they do things to reach the next level. So that open-mindedness is key. Well, let's move away from the executive team for a second then. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, all right. So you come in, the company already has a marketing team, okay? Maybe junior, yeah. mid-level folks, right? How does hiring a fractional CMO 
improve things for them? Well, I think the first thing is those people. Depends, on the approach, depends on the approach of the CMO. Right. The approach I would take is the first thing, I would engage with the current group and ask them for their views and their opinions so that they feel heard and they feel part of the team. That's number one. Number two is I'd encourage them to challenge themselves to be different, to think differently, and to portray new ideas. So what are they currently doing? What do they think they should be doing? Right. And then layer on top of them what the organization's goals and strategy are so that you're not only getting them to think about it in the context of what they have been doing, but what they should be doing in terms of delivering the goals that the organization is looking for. And finally, ensure you build a team. Because if you don't have a team and you've got a whole lot of individuals, you know what it's like on a hockey team, okay? You need defense, mm -hmm. you need attack. If you don't put those two things together, uh, one or the other is not going <coughs> to going to be successful and I, I would I would really take sales and make sales part of that whole sort of mentality of thinking because to me marketing the defense and sales is the attack and when the two work together and you've got a good marketing team and you've got a good sales team and they work together then you're, the odds of success go through the roof. And John what do you think I'm in marketing uh, it's a year into the future Right, I'm on the marketing team. It's a year into the future. We've had a fractional CMO for a year. Like, how would things be better typically compared yeah, to where really, we were a year ago? Yeah, it really depends on how it starts. Right, that's mm. that's the key right there. And and my advice for all fractionals, CMOs or not, like, because fractionals happening on operations teams and finance teams and everything is, you have to go in with the number one uh, aspect and the best way to enter any situation, and that is with empathy. Empathy is our best friend, right? You have to go in as a listener. Uh, they are, what are they going to feel? They're going to feel like, is my job threatened? Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to do this. I thought I was qualified. Uh, I'm going to resist, right? It is going to be full of friction. There is, that's just the reality of it, right? Now, you're an ally. That's our job as fractional leaders, right? We are there to be an ally for, on, on behalf of the company's growth. So you know your first minute in, you've got a team that's looking at you sideways, right? But you got to love them. You got to care for them. You got to help them succeed. You got to help them win. So you have to come in as an ally and you have to come in with empathy when you do that and carry that for the rest of the year, the, uh, the rest of the 365 days, they're going to find the support they need. They got a lot to learn, right? They're going right. to find support that they haven't had because the CEOs can't give marketing leadership, right? Um, they say they can, but they can't. Let's just be honest. They're busy CEOing. Um, so they have an ally. Right. They have somebody who's an interested in their own success. Right. As a leader, I'm like, I, my job is to build you up. Right. This whole thing works on everybody working together really, really well, me included. Right. So empathy and ally is great. Also, you have to step into the mentorship role. When so I let's have... talk about that, hold on. Let's talk about that for a second then. So yeah. let's say I'm a junior employee, I'm a junior mm -hmm. marketer. Okay. Mm -hmm. My company's hired a fractional CMO. Like, mm -hmm. what am I going to learn working under a, maybe my first ever CMO in the year that that person has been engaged for? Yeah, you bet. Well, this is this is sort of the beauty of the whole thing is what are you going to learn as a, okay, let's just say you're a 27-year-old junior, mm -hmm. right? So the first thing you have to know is like, well, I'm looking at 25 more years of experience and understanding and wisdom than I have right now. So it's in their best interest just to listen. Yeah. Right. You get it. You're, you're, you you get to sit underneath many versions of Seth Godin's, right? The mm -hmm. sages, right? So it's 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 for anybody to learn. They have to have that learning mindset, right? And to be around leaders that understand this stuff, you're going to learn by osmosis. You're going to learn by listening and learning. That's of course the best way to learn. You're also going to be challenged, right? Our job is to challenge, but in in a healthy way. So I'll come in. I'm like, oh, gosh, man, I see this. You're struggling. I'm going to challenge you on that. You just paid, placed fifty thousand dollars in media, and I have no idea what the KPIs are, and we really don't even understand the message there. That was not a good decision, but that's okay. I got your back. We're going to back out of that and get strategic. Right. So you always return to strategy, and that's something that mostly doesn't happen in marketing. It's like we return to tactics and spend, and we look forward. 
as opposed to, you know, you just, just return to strategy, double check your steps, work together on it, and they'll be fine. So that's what they learn. It's, it's great learning. That being said, we only learn by failing. That's the only way. Yeah. It's the best way to learn is we have to fail. So we also have to let that happen, too. And Neville, what do you think if I'm a junior marketer? What am I going to learn working under a fractional CMO for a year? Yeah, and I agree with John. It, it's all about strategy and it's thinking. It's thinking bigger than what you probably have been thinking about up until then. Um, I, I, I keep on talking about it's not, a, not just about digital. And I think most young marketers are not marketers, they're digital people. Yeah. And so learning what makes marketing beyond digital is really one of the things that most junior teams can learn from. And once you take them into the strategic space and talk to them about strategy and talk to them about things outside what they know, if they're open-minded, just like the leader needs to be, that tells you that they're the right kind of person for that team. If they're not, it tells you something very different. And sometimes you, you need to make the hard decisions, right? Sometimes it's not only about uh, stroking the egos and uh, making sure that uh, people are not unhappy, but you know, if there have been some wrong hires, then perhaps you need to do a little bit of cleaning house and bring in the right people to do the right job that the strategy and the organization requires. Well, Neville, you just mentioned something there about like the wrong hires. So like what kind of fractional CMO gets renewed? Uh, uh, a fractional probably the most, probably other than how do you find clients, right? Probably the most favorite question of all fractional CMOs is how do they get renewed? They, they get renewed when they succeed. Yeah. That's, that's the bottom line. And, and, and to me, success is not only in the eyes of the CEO. Uh, to me, success is in, is, is, is in the eye of the entire team. Because you, you don't know as a CMO, and you probably find that out over the time that you spend being part of that executive team, who are the power brokers in that executive team that has mm -hmm. uh, has the ear uh, or has that is the greatest influence of the CEO? You may be partially succeeding, and someone feels aggrieved that you are partially uh, partially succeeding, and is part of the executive team that goes and scoffs everything that that you're doing. Okay. So that's why I always talk about making sure that the executive team, including the CEO, is part of it. If, if you can't collaborate with the rest of the team, uh, chances are uh, a grenade can be thrown at any time right. and, yeah. uh, and you've got a problem. So ultimately it's success. If you've promised ABC and you've been delivered all the tools to do that, then you will get renewed. But collaboration with the team will guarantee that if everybody buys in and pushes that flywheel in the same direction. If there's anyone pushing in the opposite direction, could be pointed at the CMO that, oh, well, they were the person that created that dissonance, so you know, they're the problem. I think success and clearly defined goals and deliverables will make for uh, a, a repeat, and, you know, just I've spent 17 years with clients, guys. Okay, oh. and the only way that happens is not because, and that's with different leaders, different CEOs, different managing partners. It's because I was able to nurture the leadership team in support of the initiatives that I was working on. All right, I've got another question for you guys. Um, we'll worry about renewals, like, that's fine. Uh, so there are easier ways to make a living, right? Why do you, uh, we'll start with John. Like, why do you do this? I am not a fractional CMO, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why do I do it? Um, why is so, this fun? Why is this fun? So uh, uh, I, I answer this question a lot and it comes down to there's freedom, mm -hmm. there's opportunity, and there's fulfillment in here. 
and, and I'll break those apart. Like what, you're your own boss, right? You have, you're free to fail and succeed at to your own devices. That is intoxicating to, to yeah. certain people. It certainly is intoxicating to me. There's opportunity. Like if I'm a line CMO at a Fortune Five, I don't have that much opportunity. There's one ladder; it goes one direction, and there's very mm-hmm. few people on it. And there's all sorts of factors. I don't even want that kind of success, right? So I go in and I have opportunity with three or four clients. I get to go speak publicly. Like the opportunity set is 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 limitless. So there's opportunity here. That's that's intoxicating. And uh, the fulfillment. I help companies that are small and ha- and have big dreams and uh, are early in their in their growth stage and are struggling. And I call them the backbone of America. Like these are the these are my people. I love this. Right. I guess I would do fine. Maybe not. I don't know. In a Fortune 10, fine, whatever. Right. I don't love it. Right. I love the 10 million dollar manufacturing company that is struggling and they don't have it figured out. But man, they want to change something and they want to help their community. Like, that's why I do this. That's why I do it. Neville, how about you? Why do yeah, you do that? I, why is I, this fun for you? Yeah, I, I agree with everything John says. But I want to add one thing, which to me is the cornerstone. And that is make a difference. Okay? And, and I've, I've been there and done it a few times. And the pleasure you get out of making a difference and seeing an organization, not an individual, but an organization flourish because of what you have been able to help them accomplish. There's, there's no there's no better drug than, than that. There is. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I, I point, and, and I learned this very early in my career as a 23, 24 year old in marketing. I was given an opportunity to create loyalty for a 70-store retail organization. That they, they were unable to create loyalty, and I ultimately created the first cash retail loyalty program in the world in the 1980s. And how do I know it succeeded? 40 years later, the company still has my loyalty program as a cornerstone of their marketing. And when, when you look at that, when you look at those long-term benefits that you provide an organization, is there a better drug than anything, than that pleasure and, 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 and the smiles on their faces? And the interesting thing is most of the people that are there 10, 15, 20 years later don't even get it, don't even know what has happened. But that, that self-satisfaction of seeing... Yep. The Making yeah. a difference is, is, is really like a drug. All right. Well, this, is. Has been, this has been so great, guys. Uh, Neville, who should get in contact with you and how should they do it? Yeah. So uh, owners, CEOs, CFOs, presidents, anyone in the suite, uh, C, C-suite of uh, second phase growth companies, they've grown up, they've hit the ceiling, and now they want to mm-hmm. invest in marketing. Um, usually in the five to 100 million range of revenue. So I'm similar to, to John in terms of size, those smaller organizations, specifically in manufacturing, distribution, and professional services in both B2C and B2B fields. Yeah. Uh, particularly if they want to expand into new markets, new products, new services, new brands. Neville, I will say, uh, as far as the how, you are of the approximately, this is episode 51, there's about 100 fractional CMOs now have been on this podcast. You are only the third that ever had a phone number. Uh, so there you go. Pretty rare. I like being, I like being different, okay? I like yeah, you're just going to put your phone number right on the internet. Why not? And <laughs> John, how about you? I want to give to my clients. You? I want my clients <laughs> to say, wow. Well, yeah. I haven't thought of this. That's really unique. So LinkedIn, uh, mastermindsolutions.ca website. And then please call me. I, I, I'm delighted to talk to people, debate with people, argue with people. 905-886-2235. Have a free chat with me. That's, uh, really that's, a, that's, that's a great idea, Neville. Like tell people your phone number and tell them you want to argue with them. That's fantastic. Yeah. There will be no yeah. shortage of people ready to do that. Yeah. As long as you're open-minded and and accept change 
Hey, we'll yeah. have a wonderful debate. And John, how about you? Who should reach out to you and how should they get in contact with you? You bet, you bet. So the people who should reach out to me are people with shitty sales numbers. If you do not like your sales numbers, yeah. there's almost always a marketing reason for that. And that's who people that's who people should call me. Sometimes that's a CEO, sometimes that's a COO, sometimes it's a CISO, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a fractional integrator, these people from EOS. Right. But if you're looking at your sales like this ain't good, man, this ain't good, the reason is almost always there's a marketing problem. There could be a sales problem, there could be a, there's the beginnings, right? Almost right. always there's a marketing problem. So people who are suffering that reality. Uh, uh, these are the people who should call me. And, and there's a lot of ways I can help. I coach, I, you can hire me, I'll talk on the phone, but address the problem. And they go to your website, the one on screen? Yeah, you can go to my website. You'll find uh, all the things, the, the phone number, the workshops I have. Uh, and I share a bunch of information, right. share a lot of resources and tools. But if those numbers suck, give me a call. All right, guys, this has been really great. <laughs> thanks, Neville. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks Thank for watching. You. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys. We do have guests now that have come back and, and been on multiple seasons now. So hopefully we'll talk to you guys again sometime. And in the meantime, thanks, everyone.